Welcome everyone um, and good afternoon. My name is Courtney Hunt and I am the art and design librarian at the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. I'm so incredibly pleased to have the honor of introducing our speakers today. This event is a program in support of the exhibition currently up in Thompson Library Gallery um, called Abject Object Feminism Art in the Academy and is co-sponsored by the Departments of Art, History of Art, and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. There will be a virtual gallery walkthrough after the conversation today. You are welcome to stay on in the Zoom. Um, there's no extra link or anything. Um, and join us. If, and if you're in person, feel free to tag along. Um, I'll be speaking over a speaker um, just to sort of address it. I was supposed to be in person with you all, um, but my son has been ill, uh, so I'm home. Um, but I'm I'm going to keep going now. <laughs> the legacy of feminism here at Ohio State is rich and was very active in the 1980s. In 1983, the National Women's Studies Association held their fifth annual convening at OSU. And as part of the programming around that conference, feminist art critic Lucy Lepard, um, who is here with us today, was invited to curate an exhibition of feminist art, which became All's Fair, Love and War and in new feminist art. Um, and then you can see in the image on this title screen, um, this is actually an envelope enclosure. It was a set of postcards for the exhibition catalog for that show. 20 artists work was on display, including that of Tomia Arai. Today, Tomia and Lucy come back together to discuss the legacy and future of feminist art. Both women have dedicated their lives and careers, not just to art, but to activism. Lucy Lepard is a feminist art critic and influential scholar in the areas of conceptual, multicultural, and activist art based in New Mexico. Um, her contributions to the field of feminist art criticism, art history, curation, everything are immense and would be difficult to enum enumerate quickly here. Among her most well-known volumes are From the Center, Feminist Essays on Women's Art, and Eva Hess, both published in 1976, though she has written over 20 books. Lucy also co-founded the artist book publisher and bookstore Printed Matter, which all of us librarians know very well. Um, the journal Heresies, a feminist journal on art and politics and the organization's ad hoc women artists, women's action coalition and the women's art registry among others. This past September, Lucy published her most recent book called Stuff instead of a memoir, um, which I personally cannot wait to read. Uh, Tomia Arai is a public artist based in New York. Among her many accomplishments, in 2015, she co-founded the cultural collective, the Chinatown Art Brigade with artists Betty Yu and Monsi Kong. She is currently an artist in residence with the Committee Against Anti-Asian Violence or CAV, a grassroots organization that mobilizes working class Chinese and Bengali tenants uh, to fight for housing rights. And in addition to our two main speakers, this conversation will be moderated by two experts on feminist and social activist art, Erina Dugan, professor of art history at Texas State University, and Marissa Vigno, associate professor of art history at Utah State University. So welcome to all of you. Erina's exhibition at Tufts University, Art for the Future, Artists Call and Central American Solidarities, um, the exhibition catalog for which we have in our library. So check it out examined a brief but impactful moment in the 1980s art history when the art community rallied together to speak out against U.S. intervention in Central America. Lucy was one of the co-founders of Artist Call and Tomia's work was included in the main benefit exhibition in 1984 at Judson Memorial Church. Marissa Vigno is an expert on feminism's influence on artistic production and visual representation, and from 2019 to 2020 was an Andrew W. Mellon's Senior Fellow in the Department of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, researching and writing on the pioneering feminist artist Hannah Wilkie. So welcome. <laughs> that was a lot. Um, but I would love to get us started by just asking um, maybe a deceptively simple question. Um, but while conducting research on abject object and going through all these archives, it is clear to me that there was such a strong network of feminist artists and curators communicating and collaborating during the 1980s. Um, and then, you know, looking at Erin's work, um, the networks were just so strong during that time. But I want to know, how did Lucy and Tomia meet? What is your origin story? 
I have I have no idea. I have no no memory of anybody I met when. I mean, we were all hanging out in the same same places. So, and I knew to me as muralist work and so forth. Uh, to me, what, do you have any memory of that? I well, I'm glad to hear that you have the same problems <laughs> um, remembering the past. I mean, it is a little like time travel, and um, we even had a. Um, I I was trying to explain to Courtney why I didn't have any memory of the work in the actual original show all's fair uh it it's not that long ago i guess 40 years is but um uh you know back in those days we didn't document obsessively the way we do now um but i do remember that um i was i was in a show at basement workshop that lucy you might have written about or it was either basement workshop or king king Kiwaba house and um, I had some work about, uh, which I labeled nuclear portraits and, oh, okay. <laughs> there are some images from the, the past. Um, and you, without even meeting me, Lucy, you invited me to do a window for printed matter. And um, I came up with something, I think it was called Atomic TV because I was, kind of obsessed or pop obsessed with all things atomic in those in those days. So I guess it um it probably led to being included in this show. But um actually, you know, being invited to be in conversation with you was I was a little dumbstruck <laughs> because um we, you know, I admire you so much. Um in fact, you know, I I told people, oh, you know, Lucy is my hero and I'm going to be in conversation and I would have much rather we could have brewed a cup of tea and had this conversation in a kitchen and just kind of catched up because we haven't seen each other in something like 30, 40 years. Uh, in fact, I have an autographed copy of Mixed Blessing from 1990. And I think that might have been the last time I saw you. Yeah, yeah well, that's, but, I moved to New Mexico around that time. So and gave up on New York. <laughs> but I did, I did have a, so this is a quick reflection. Um, I actually started thinking about why some of the people that I've known since that time are still friends or still so much on my radar in terms of, you know, even possibly being uh, a moral compass for me. You know, like I think back about those people and wonder, you know, what they would think of what I'm doing. Or, um, and it's not as if we have... Uh, you know, uh, intense contact with each other. But I, I feel like going back to those days, I do remember that, and I credit you, Lucy, so much for this, um, being in these large shows, these group shows that you curated, um, where I met so many artists. And in fact, I felt like these shows were more about building community than anything else. And uh, those friendships or relationships that I met during those days weren't just based around exhibiting art, but you know we went on to participate in organizations, many of which you founded, um, and contribute work to Heresies, to um, PAD, People's Organs, uh, for documentation distribution. Um, I, I later went on to be a board member of Printed Matter. Um, for a few years, and I think that it was that um, community, you know, that was so sustaining. And you know, I really don't think that that could have happened unless people people invested in in that community and felt such a deep sense of trust with each other. You know, I think that that's really an unusual thing for a curator to be able to do when they put together artists and art, you know, to to have that ultimate trust that the artist will show up <laughs> and and bring something to the show. And, you know, I feel like curatorial strategies now are so different. You know, they're so uh, much about a curatorial vision. And um, I, I always felt that with you, it was about building relationships. Well, certainly, I, I used to call myself an organizer of shows instead of a curator, and I still don't call myself a curator because so many shows I curated were in bizarre places that, that 
academia wouldn't take seriously, like libraries or streets or whatever, <laughs> union halls, and so forth. But but I was creating a, a and I I didn't create this community, but I certainly needed this community every bit as anybody else did, much as anybody else did. And it it uh, it, it's it really is still my community too. I, I still have the same feeling. I was hiking in Oak Creek Canyon in Arizona a few years ago, and there's a couple coming toward us, and it turns out to be Christy Rupp, who's in this show. <laughs> I mean, just out in the middle of nowhere, uh, way off in the middle of the canyons, and there's Christy. So the community continues. That's Oh, that's such a beautiful reflection. I always, um, I feel lucky to, um, you know, have learned about your communities um, because they've definitely been impactful for me um, thinking back to this period. So I wonder, Lucy, um, I know it's like um, a long time ago <laughs> this exhibition happened, um, but I'm just curious if you would reflect at all about the title Love and War, um, if you have any recollections of things that you might have been thinking, you know, things in the air. Um, certainly, I think your discussion with Tamea about community is indicative of love, but I'm wondering too, you know, what, what about war? How is that also circling in the, in the air at this moment? Well, feminism is really about love and war. I mean, we learn to like each other as women, which wasn't always the case beforehand. It was the, the women coming together was, it was a big thing about feminism because I, for one, thought I was one of the boys for years. And then it came as a sort of a shock when I realized I was just another woman. And you know, but and then working with women was such an eye opener for me. And the war part of it, we're still at war. We're feminism is still battling. I mean, look at the Roe v. Wade stuff and so forth. I mean, there are endless issues that haven't changed a bit since the 70s, which is when I was mostly writing about feminism and stuff. But it's uh, it's still there. Things have not changed that much. As Mikal Hebron has done a, a thing called Gallery Tally, or she did several years ago, but it, I can't remember the dates of it, but it's it's quite recent. And she discovered that, you know, the, the statistics are really not that different. Well, I thought the statistics of showing and everything would be different. I know the price situation isn't, but I've never kept track of the marketplace. So that's somebody else's problem. But anyway, we, we are still in love and war, I think. But it also, I just usually get titles for things before I even think about the thing itself. So the title just, I like the title. <laughs> it's, I know that's your, I think um, one of your great contributions are your, your catchy titles. I always love <laughs> the titles that you come up with. Um, and uh, there's a new book, there's a new collection of the feminist essays coming out of my old things. And, uh, it's called Moving Targets, and and I, I like that. <laughs> so, That's a good one, too. We still are moving targets. And there's... We are. Um, so thinking about, I mean, I, I was thinking, too, about, uh, you know, literally what wars were happening in the 80s. Um, obviously, my own interest in the wars that were taking place in Central America, I feel like that was, um, had to be, like, somewhere in your mind. Um, and... Uh, or at least um, circling around. But I'm wondering too, I mean, it feels like, and you know, looking at some of the work that was included in the show that there was um, a lot of thinking kind of around um, and activism around um, anti-nuclear, right? Um, uh, so thinking about the intersection of anti-nuclear activism um, with feminist issues. And I'm just curious for either of you, if that was, um, you know, something that you were thinking about involved in at that moment. Um, I know Tameo shared, Tameo shared some images even of um, this wonderful photograph of her working on, um, I don't know if we have that, Courtney, somewhere. Oh, yeah, there it is. Uh, at the Women's Encampment for a Future of Peace and Justice, which I love this idea um, of the future, thinking about these communities and how 
you know, um, they are working towards shaping different futures, alternate futures. So I'm just curious if you all remember anything. I know us historians can be, you know, always so demanding, asking you to <laughs> remember things, details that you're like, ah. <laughs> Well, to me, you should talk to that because I wasn't at this one. There was Greenham, <laughs> Greenham, Greenham Common in England, and I don't remember the date exactly of that, but that was a lot of women, new player thing. I was always peripherally involved in any new stuff, but till I moved to New Mexico where you're in the middle of it all. But to me, I talk about the, the Seneca stuff. Well, I, I share this uh, image with uh, Courtney because it happened to be the exact same year that uh, the exhibition All's Fair uh, was at um, Ohio University, and um, I, you know, just uh, it just happened that uh, uh, some women neighbors and I decided to trek up to upstate New York, Seneca Falls, uh, to protest the deployment of these cruise missiles to Europe. And um, this is a photo of. Uh, art build outside of a barn in the mud. It rained the whole weekend um, for a, a protest at the army depot. But um, I think that, of course, you know, these these issues about war were always on our mind. And I, I grew up in post-war in New York, um, five years after the bomb on Hiroshima was dropped in 1945. And um, I think that the anti-nuclear peace movement was something that I grew up with, um, although I, I do feel like it was probably the anti-Vietnam War movement that was more um, uh, more powerfully shaped my um, views about the world uh, and all the wars in Asia and the Middle East after that. You know, I think that that became so much a part of my identity as an American, as an Asian living in America that was in uh, just um, uh, continual wars in Asia. Um, but, I, but I feel like um, the idea of struggle, uh, you know, that, that in, in terms of the metaphor of the show, the idea of um, what it takes to struggle for social justice um, really goes back to something I just read actually in, in, um, by Robin Wall Kimmerer, uh, who called for a social justice movement that was equal parts rage and love. And um, I think that um, we have to be enraged and angry about the, the, the harm that's being done across the world and to the earth, you know, but we can't do that unless we you know, we can collectively envision the future we really want to build, you know, a future where we care and love for each other. Couldn't agree more. The Vietnam War was also my my moment of recognition of, I mean, I, New Yorkers are, it, tend to be, New Yorkers are not activists anyway, and I wasn't originally, uh, tend to be very provincial. We, we don't, look out as much as uh, I know Arlene Gobard, who you say is going to speak there soon. She was uh, in the 80s. This is the early 80s, around the same time. She would, We were screaming and yelling and wheat pasting and yelling in the streets and what have you. Uh, and she said, you know, there's a lot of going on in community arts all over the country. And we know nothing about it because we were New Yorkers. <laughs> and boy, she, did she ever give me an education on that and, and uh, opened up a whole lot of things. New York itself, of course, is highly diverse. When I published Mixed Blessings, I had a very strange conversation. This, I think I was doing something at Franklin Furness about it or it was just being mentioned or something. And this uh, curator from the modern, and frankly, I don't even remember who it was anymore, but it was a woman. And she came up to me and afterwards she said, where do you find all these people? And I, I looked at her, I thought, we're living in New York. There's there's the basement workshop. There's the Asian American, whatever it was called. Uh, there's the studio museum. There was the Hispanic uh, Cultural Center. There was, uh, and then there was the American Indian Community House. I mean, where do you find these people? They're right under your nose. And that was what was so annoying about New York in a way. <laughs> it's so many cliques involved. And, Forth, anyway. But Lucy, you were one of the first uh, art writers and critics to call out the institutional racism in, in our cultural institutions. And um, 
you know, I, I really feel that that plus the fact that you were um, so aware of your position as a white woman writing about artists of color and um, your, um, I, I, I think that your decision to, to write mixed blessings despite you know, some of the blowback you, you might have anticipated would come from that was was so important. You know, I, I, I can't underscore how important that book was, um, not just for the people in the book, or the artists that you you uh, you featured in the book, but just you know the the seriousness and the intent and the careful and thoughtful way that you presented the work. Um, I just um, I feel like you know it had. But I've um, learned everything I know about art from artists. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. You know, one of the questions no, that somebody asked me to ask you was, you know. Um, do you think we're still in the era, era of mixed blessings? How, how has the art world changed since then? Well, in those days, there was a, a period where uh, gabachos or honkies or whatever were sort of allowed in. To, and I was part of, the, of a dialogue, I mean, a, a, a multi-log or whatever from all over the country. And I learned an immense amount by, by doing this. And uh, now I think white people are really not allowed to say much. I just finished... Well, actually, a couple of years ago, a neighbor of mine, an activist artist, Peggy Diggs, and I wrote something on on uh, whiteness and feminism. And the editing process was really interesting. I mean, it, I won't get into it, but you could you could tell the difference between now and forty years ago by what I was being allowed to say and so forth. And in those days, I just I you know I had the idea of putting it all together, and I asked somebody from I think Marga Machida was the Asian I went to and asked if I should do this and Jean was quick to see Smith who was also in this show was the Native American and so on and I said you know is it okay if I do this and they said yes and then then it <laughs> not everybody agreed <laughs> let's put it that way but I expected that I have a thick skin so that's that's not a major problem but I, I learned an immense amount from that and it opened up my community immensely as well Part of the my community, my the opening up was the lovely things I get from Tamiya for every every uh, Chinese New Year. <laughs> These beautiful little I should have brought one to hold up, but uh, beautiful prints of the current zodiac creature. Anyway, well, I, so I, I just I just want to intervene here by saying that even though Lucy and I haven't seen each other in thirty years, every year. I send her a Lunar New Year card and she responds by sending me a postcard. And it's like this just lovely reciprocal exchange that has taken place, you know, without anything else, you know, but a greeting, you know, an, an acknowledgement of each other's presence. I just find, uh, you know, actually very beautiful. So thank you. I I've remembered to do it in the last couple of years. <laughs> I've got the rabbit is up on my bookcase, so I I, I know it I know it's there. Anyway, it's, yeah, lovely. it's lovely too because the you know the exhibition catalog for Love and War was a series of postcards. Um, so I love that this right <laughs> that was. Uh, do we have an image of that, Courtney? Somewhere I, I think. Yes, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment so I don't give you all sort of like motion sickness um, <laughs> and then I'll reshare. I don't have an image of the postcards, but I have an image of the poster which had the postcards on there. And I also just wanted to jump in really quickly and say that in doing research for this project, um, postcards played very heavily into it, um, not just with the catalog, but also the correspondence that was happening um, among the artists and the curators of the shows, um, Anna Mendieta sent a, a letter to assistant director Stephanie Blackwood, who curated um, this exhibition called Rape in 1985, um, on two postcards of her own work. And so there was this, the postcards you bring up, it's, there was this cycle of them. So I just wanted to mention that from an archival point of view, um, that it was really interesting going through all of those I love postcards and now of course it's email. I mean, I find myself not not doing what I should be doing is <laughs> sending postcards, but it's a lot easier just to dash off an email and so on, which is too bad because I still have a wonderful package of postcards from all kinds of people. Well, I think that could, 
Oops, sorry, Arna. <laughs> No, I was just going to say, Lucy, too, I've seen some of your notebooks and I love that you would put a postcard on, you know, your, your personal notebooks as well. Like it seemed like postcards were <laughs> so central. Day books, open notebooks, yeah. And each postcard had something to do with that year, like Central mm -hmm. America, with him, the year I went to Nicaragua. Oh, yeah. Well, one reason the postcards, I don't remember whose idea that was. Maybe it was mine. I'm not sure. But I've always liked cards, too. And so that I did these conceptual shows in 69, 70 through 74, which had cards where, where the entire catalog were cards. I call them my card shows because they had awful titles, which were the populations of the cities. And nobody could ever remember what the population of anything was so anyway the so cards are part of i think the randomness appeals to me because i have a very random mind i mean i flip <laughs> around a lot of different things and i think that's part of uh it's kind of multitasking it's what you get if you're a, a a mother and a partner and a writer and a so forth and so on and you're trying to do stuff out of the house and that's uh it's sort of like flipping cards well i have a uh, crates of artist cards, artist announcements from mm -hmm. back in the 70s and 80s. And uh, it's hard for people to uh, remember that uh, back in the day before computers, uh, we actually had to announce shows with, with postcards. And um, uh, it's sad that, you know, today, I mean, I remember teaching a class where the elementary school kids did not know what a postcard was. They literally had never seen one before because they didn't get mail. Um, but, um, uh, you know, with the publication of Howie Chen's book, Godzilla, which is really a compendium of ephemera, you know, yeah. people have been asking, well, how did you get people to come to meetings? You know, how did you get people to, you know, participate? And I had to to explain to them that we, we sent out postcards <laughs> and we sent out newsletters and uh, maybe two weeks later, later, we'd get a response. I mean, the the time passing in those days was was probably unimaginable. When we were doing the Art Workers Coalition, uh, we did that, of course. I mean, we sent out a postcard to get people to come to the meetings, and we said we were going to kidnap Kissinger, and the FBI showed up. <laughs> like, <laughs> so you can you can take that too far. <laughs> Amazing. Well, it seems like you know, postcards are these ways to continue to create connections and relationships, and they also form so much of the archives that we do have. And Lucy, you've been giving material to the archives of American art since the 1970s and the amazing collection that they have there. And, and there has been a whole initiative that was largely driven by the, the feminist archivists that they've had at the Archives of American Art to make sure that we had these collections of voices and materials and that after 40, 50 years that they, they continue to grow. And so I wonder, you know, what role has Archives played for you? You know, thinking about the collection of your stuff, right? As you make these archives of, of your lives and what become our lives, these networks, and like what activist potential does the archive hold? It holds a lot. I mean, it, it's, uh, I, I, I admire the people who plow through them. I mean, I, I prefer to read a book and just get it from that. But uh, the, the scholars have gone to the archives of American art and just like plowed through immense amounts of stuff. And in the 70s, I was, it was terrible. I didn't really have a, a good idea about them. And I just, everything I did wasn't interested in that came into the house and I'm a pack rat and I didn't like <laughs> throw anything away. And I would just toss in a box and send to the archives. And a lot of it is just useless. And I begged them when I got to know more about them and know them more that uh, to please just throw out the crap that they didn't really need it, it was useless but of course archivists can't throw anything out and, and I had enough at it myself but I'm working now on, on I've been working for six or seven years trying to get rid of my thousands of books and and tchotchkes and what have you and uh, I've got a wonderful younger artist Mira Borak who's been helping me do that for a long time and and we the, the workroom is still a, a big mess I mean it's I, I note the nice Nice, neat books behind you all, but I didn't have that. I have <laughs> piles of stuff. I mean, it's appalling. 
And so I think archives are immensely important. But I mean, I'm, sometimes I'm kind of embarrassed with what people come up with because I just dump things in a box and send it off to them. And somebody will say, oh, what about this? And I go, uh-oh, I mean, I shouldn't have put that in. And whatever. But it's, it's all, let the chips fall where they may. <laughs> I, mean, I, I would love to see your archives, Lucy. Um, yeah. I, I really believe the archives are an you know, activist practice. In fact, um, I know uh, many artists are very invested in preserving the histories and, and um, spaces you know, in which their communities reside. And um, I've, I think that um, uh, Thinking about the archives as possibly a space of collective memory, you know, is is exactly. even expanding it into a kind of public space, you know, where we can all participate, you know, in reclaiming and re-remembering the past, which is so important to you know just understanding where we can go in the future. Um, but I've you know I've had a real privilege actually of working with groups like Interference Archive in Brooklyn and mm -hmm. um, other uh, archivists and activists on projects like uh, the APA Voices of COVID Public Memory Project, which um, we were, we initiated during the pandemic. I, I drag around a, my, my nice purple tote bag. It's my favorite one from Interference Archive. <laughs> so tell them that. <laughs> And, uh, and I worked in a library, but my, the only job I've ever had, actual job and not freelancing, was at the Museum of Modern Art Library. So I, I, I think I came to an understanding without trying or without thinking about it much of how important these things were. And how. And you mentioned Godzilla. I, I wrote a long review of the Godzilla tome in, in Brooklyn Rail and fairly recently. And that was a fascinating book because of its archival uh, structure, sort of. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's it's um, it's it's amazing how uh, history and learning about, uh, particularly histories of activism, can actually be such an important tool in organizing um, today. You know, because uh, I think we're facing so many challenges. Um, we're so divided. Uh, and we're so, um, I think, uh, subject to so much uh, you know, erasure and mm -hmm. uh, just repression. Now, um, all of our, all of our rights are being eroded. Um, that we have to learn about, you know, what people did to fight for those rights. You know, and how they. I know. wish when we did when we started the AWC, the Artworks Coalition. We should have known something because it was that was in the late 60s. And as recently as 20 years before that, in the late 40s, there were artists, activists protesting museums and stuff. We didn't know anything about that. I mean, we found out eventually, but we, we didn't have the models that we could have that would have been very valuable. So that's definitely mm -hmm. a part of it. And Tonya, I love what you said there about this idea of like remembering, right? The archive is a space that gives us a route to remember, to pull back together. And it is because of the archive that the show that Courtney has so beautifully curated at OSU right now, Abstract Object, came about, right? It, it allows us to look back and see something of the past through our present and future lens. And last December, uh, I was able to see the 52 Women Artists show at the Aldrich, which itself was a sort of like remembering and representing Lucy's 1971 exhibition, 26 uh, uh, Women Artists, right? Uh, which we, as far as we know, is the first feminist art exhibition to be held in the US. No, it wasn't the first feminist art exhibition. I think it may have been the first feminist exhibition in a museum and given it's a very small museum, but it was, but I think it was the first museum show of the second wave, but not the first feminist show. I mean, uh, no. museum show. Yes, yes. Um, and so, and then seeing that, uh, where so I think all but four artists who were in the original show from 71 were shown again, as much of their work was shown again in 20, um, what was like 2022 there. So this idea of, um, you know, looking back to the past, bringing into the present, thinking about the future, thinking about how 
how the future of feminisms continues to evolve, like what interests you the most right now about feminist politics, about artists whose work is informed by feminisms, writers, curators, activists? I, I'm sort of out of the art world now, so I, this is not a question I can really answer very intelligently. I mean, I'm, I'm always a feminist. It changed my life and it would certainly change it badly if I gave up feminism or anything. But I do have, I have younger artists who come up and I'm always talking about this, but younger artists who come up and say, well, I don't call myself a feminist, but I'm a strong woman and I stand up for myself. And I say, well, bully for you, but uh, feminists stand up for all women, not just themselves. And that's, I think, a, something that <laughs> not altogether always obvious in current feminism. And then the whole intersectionality thing is definitely a positive and so on. But I don't, I don't write about feminism as such anymore. I mean, I've actually, I've just did two essays in the last few months, but they're, they're, they're looking back. They're, I don't have anything new to say about feminism. I mean, the, I'm, I've been in the streets about Roe v. Wade and, you know, I, I can do that kind of thing, but I don't, um, I'm not seeing the shows. I mean, there's, we have, great stuff in Santa Fe, but it's it's not exactly a, a the home of heavy activist art. So so I don't know what, and I never saw the 52 artists at the Aldridge, uh, but I was so fascinated by it. And the fa I was also fascinated by the fact they couldn't find some of the artists that I'd had in the 1971 show. They just died or vanished or something, or just didn't want to have anything to do with it. So I guess they didn't stay feminists, who knows. Mm -hmm. It's so funny to hear you say you're not in the art world anymore, Lucy. Um, but I, I actually also feel the same way. I'm, I'm certainly not in the art world anymore. Um, but uh, that aside, I, I think I feel more feminist now at 74 than I ever have in my life. Um, when I was um, younger and when I was probably more involved in... Um, identity politics of a different kind uh, I I did not relate to the uh, feminist movement as much you know I think you know and I, I reread some of the things you wrote for the pink swan and I I was so amazed at how um, honestly you wrote about feminism in in that in those essays and how um, you know you you talk about being in the gaps <laughs> between some of the many camps in feminism um, at that time. And I think I was probably a lot more in the, the concentric circles of feminism than in actually a self-proclaimed feminist. But um, today I feel like I'm almost every group that I'm in is feminist, queer and trans-led. Um, I just find myself in collectives, in um, collective formations and in organizations that are led by women, by people who are um, gender non-conforming. Um, and I also am in organizations where there are men who call themselves feminist. So um, I think things have changed quite a bit and there's just more of an urgency now. I mean, it's we're in crisis really now yes, to yes. protect um, people's rights. You know, we have to, we have to on all fronts, feminism is not a standalone issue. You know, fight, fight. Uh, yeah, totally everywhere. I, I, I realize that I think a lot of my women of color friends did feel at that point that you're talking about that in the 70s and, and maybe early 80s and so on, that, that feminism was secondary to the identity politics. And, and I think at that point, you know, and maybe still, that makes very good sense, because without the identity politics, we wouldn't know about hundreds of women who were making really good art but they wouldn't we wouldn't know about that work if it hadn't been for the identity politics movement or whatever which, uh, which from which i learned so much which actually leads, leads me to the the first question i might have had lucy um you know so many artists so many wonderful artists and i just was wondering why you invited me to be in conversation with you I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remembered you as being a wonderful activist, and I thought that's what I need. Like, wow, well, I'm I mean, very as, well as, as well as a good artist, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm always putting activism before art, and I, I shouldn't always do that. But I know artists don't like that. When I came to New Mexico, I said I, I came to get away from art, 
and uh, my artist friends were all like, oh, and I said, no, it's just the art world I'm trying to get away from and not the art, but anyway. Yeah, I remember you saying that it was a lousy place for artists. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You were saying that before anybody else was saying that the art world was a lousy place. But um, <laughs> yes, I, I am. Um, well, I, I, I'm very honored. And, and I just, uh, because I think, you know, we're very close in age. And I, I just think that I need to, to say here that it wasn't until I was in my 60s that I really felt like I needed a reset you know, that I needed to really think about um, more seriously what it meant to... Well, to me, um, we're not that close in age. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost 87. I like... <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> no, we're... You could almost be my daughter. I mean, like, if I had, had that inclination. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's only 10 years, Lucy. Uh, but... Well, it's 12 years, I mean, 13 years or something. All right, anyway, yes, you're 74. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, you're a mere child. <laughs> Watch out! <laughs> but I, for, but I do you... feel like I, I, it was much, until I was much, I was much mm -hmm. older when I founded the Chinatown Art Brigade, and uh, and it really felt like I needed to to work with grassroots organizations to really understand what it means to mobilize or organize for change. I had no clue. You so, really didn't. I mean, what, what about all that work, the murals and so on? And well, you know, I think that um, I was always a community-based artist. Um, you know, my my loyalties really were local. You know, and I I felt um, I you know I was very invested in those days with the idea of building a people's art, you know, being part of a people's art movement. But you know, I really think I was stuck in this idea that somehow ideas and art could change people's minds. I think they can change hearts and minds, certainly, but but there, you know, the one of the things that Brigade, the Chinatown Art Brigade has been doing is, you know, we're really asking artists to be organizers, you know, to be involved. Uh, we're not asking them to make political art. Um, we're we're really asking them to think about how they can participate in change, and and if art is one way to do it, yeah, you know, certainly those are. The but if things. artists are going to participate, artists tend to do it through art. Uh, you know, just, I mean, trying to organize artists for years, and it was just like sometimes it was just like herding cats. Uh, you know, they would somebody would talk big about how they were against nuclear or something. And then you try to get them out in the streets and they say, well, I'm working on a show or there's a critic coming over or something. And it, it, it was irritating. But you were but a, a cultural activist long before any of us used that term. I mean, I think you were you really modeled what it meant to to be a writer and activist and a cultural worker. Well, wait till you hear Arlene Gobard talk about this. She's very articulate, much more so than I am. And she she is wonderful at talking about all, all of this. And um, anyway, look forward to that. She's a neighbor of mine, by the way. <laughs> I think this is a, maybe a good point for us to shift to questions because um, we don't have a terrible amount of time left. Um, is that okay with everyone that we go to questions? We have a couple already. Um, I think people will probably ask some more. Um, this has been an amazing conversation so far. So thank you so much. And the image that I've shared right now, uh, Tomia sent me earlier today, which is a new work. Um, Tomia, do you want to say anything about this before we go to um, Q&A? Just talking about, well, not a new work, but a newer work from 2010. Do you want to Sure, yeah. yeah, I guess just uh, I was uh, because we couldn't find the images from the show uh, that were largely portraits that I had um, submitted. Um, I thought I would just submit a, a more recent portrait uh, that was uh, commissioned by the American Friends Service Committee uh, for a traveling uh, mural show about the impact of the Afghan war and the civilian casualties that have resulted. And so I just wanted to do a sort of self-portrait about how these wars had shaped my sense of um, uh, myself and identity uh, as a result you know, of, of this history of colonialization and war. 
it seems to me that archives are also really important for your work, right? I mean, not, I mean, you're, I think in, you know, the activist potential of archives, but also for just your own, your own work, thinking visually, I'm just noticing and thinking about this and the, the image that's in, um, that we did find from, from Love and War. Yes, I think, um, I, I've probably had a, made a turn towards, um, maybe because I'm on this trajectory and I'm looking a lot at the past and, and particularly um, have been invested in these issues around displacement um, through the work that I've been doing in Chinatown with the housing organization and uh, CAV and also with the China, Chinatown Art Brigade. And I was thinking about how, um, you know, we're not just protecting homes and buildings, we're protecting spaces of memory and uh, um, one of the people that I was really influenced by, uh, uh, one of the readings that I was really influenced by was um, uh, Root Shock by uh, Millie, uh, uh, Dr. Mindy Fully Love. And, you know, she talks about how our communities are ecosystems. And, you know, when we lose the places that are embedded with memories and meaning in our lives, we lose a part of ourselves. And so preserving places, memories, um, and those cultural um, connections and ties to spaces, people, and things, you know, is so important uh, in, in, you know, establishing an, a better understanding of who we are. If, if I have time to write another book, and who knows at this age, uh, I think I, I was going to do something on monuments, but monuments have, there's just so much happened on monuments, so I just like, I'll, do, I'll still bring it in, but I think I'm gonna, it's going to be called Whose Histories with a question mark, and it's about artists working with histories as opposed to this book burning situation we seem to be in now. I, I will be flattered if I call it woke. <laughs> anyway, so that's that's the next thing, maybe. Thank you to both of you for those answers. Um, I'm going to go to audience questions now. Um, there is one. I actually there's a question for Erin and Marissa from Danny Marcus, who is an associate curator at the Wexner Center for the Arts, and did a show called "To, to Begin Again," um, which was a prehistory of the Wex, and he really dove into the archives of University Gallery as well and made me aware of some of the details in the archives that I went hunting for, for my show. Um, and his question was, um, how would you situate Lucy's All's Fair exhibition at Ohio State in terms of the broader history um, of feminist and anti-imperialist exhibitions in the 1980s? Um, second part of the question was, were you surprised to learn about the project? And I think I really wanted to ask this question because it's it's in line with some of the things that we were talking about when we were preparing to talk with Tomia and, and Lucy about academic spaces, et cetera. So what where's the where's the question? Oh, so the, the question is just how would you situate Lucy's all's fair exhibition at Ohio State uh, in terms of the broader history of feminist and anti-imperialist exhibitions in the 1980s. And were you surprised to hear about the project? That second part is for Erin and Marissa, but I think anyone could answer the first part. Well, go ahead, Erin and Marissa, <laughs> leave it up. Um, I'm happy to start. Uh, I did not know about this exhibition. Um, but I was so happy to learn about it. Uh, and I have to say that when, you know, Courtney sent me the images, they seem so familiar um, to me. Um, and I think it's from looking at, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about this um, activist campaign, Artist Call, and looking at um, archives related to that campaign and looking at, um, you know, Lucy sent me this whole box full of slides um, with all of these installation shots um, because there was no, you know, checklists, which is um, <laughs> it's like, ah, um, frustrating, but, you know, amazing thing. And you just start looking at these installation shots. In fact, I was trying to find, you know, figure out which work by 
Tamayo was included at Judson, um, but there was so there was a lot of work in this. There was over eleven hundred artists that participated, and so um, I just felt like in looking at those installation shots that there was a continuity um, there. And um, and I think that I also looked at like Lucy in 84 also um, curated an exhibition at Colby College um, related to artists call called Call and Response. Um, so I've looked at that material as well. And it just seems like, I don't know, there's, there's this whole, um, you know, I don't know, collection of exhibitions that were happening that no one really talks about. Um, but that to me are very important and to me share this um, uh, this moment of collectivity um, that really, what I love about it is the way it brings all of these different artists together. Um, I think that this exhibition does that. The exhibitions that I've been looking at, you know, it brings um, the artists that you don't, like don't get talked about in relationship to one another together. And that seems to me um, vitally important. Well, surprise, mm -hmm. surprise, activist art is not talked about. I mean, it's, are we in the canon at all? I wonder. Right, and I think some of this is about the decentering as well, right? We put so much emphasis on New York and LA, so East Coast, West Coast, as being our kind of primary centers of uh, feminist art for the many ways in which it's defined coming out of the 70s, that when we look at, as we were talking about this morning, uh, collectives in Minneapolis, you know, what's happening at what becomes the Wexner and these kind of activist exhibitions at other spaces, right? And, you know, if you are at a, a smaller, you know, institution, you know, you have more space and room, maybe, maybe you do the things that quietly, right? You don't have to worry about going past all the gatekeeping of a larger institution. And so it's coming outside of those larger centers and looking at what else has always been going on? You know, the work that has always been happening never stopped, right? These conversations never stopped. The work never stopped being made. The groups never stopped gathering and activating and, you know, being loud and angry and filled with love. But it's, you know, I guess it brings us back to the archives question, right? It's about like refinding those, remembering them, bringing them back into our present views here. That leads me, and Tomia, do you want to chime in on that or? And just, just to say that, you know, I think exhibitions like this are so important because they provide access to the actual objects, you know, and, and collections in the archives and what the problem with institutional archives, um, maybe less so on university campuses, but, you know, is that um, they represent whoever it is that holds the power, you know, to mm -hmm. to own the buildings, so the you know the, the repositories of these archives. I mean, we really need to think about um, uh, accessibility mm -hmm. very differently, and also language, you know, justice, and and um, ways that we can encourage people to co-create and co-curate some of this material. Um, that's just you know, thought I would add that. The trouble is, is that now, I mean, everything is online. I mean, and Zoom, which I, I have to admit I'm not fond of, but, but we, we could never do a practice thing because something wouldn't work and so forth anyway. And in the flesh, things are, you can cope with them better. But anyway, the, uh, but the, uh, seeing things in the, in the, in the flesh, in the, the canvas or the whatever, is so important. And I totally agree, but I don't think it's important. I mean, look at the whole AI thing. I mean, it's we're going into a place where art isn't a physical or material thing. It's going to be interesting. I'm not going to be around for it, but I can help it. <laughs> so um, the next question is related to this, I think. Um, well, sorry, I'm going back and forth about <laughs> which question to ask. There's, there's some really good ones here and we don't have much time. Um, so I'll ask the next question. This is from uh, Amanda Tobin Ripley. Um, I 
who asks, I'm hoping Lucy could speak about the Art Workers Coalition and early organizing days with Pasta MoMA and what you learned from those efforts that might be important for contemporary arts slash museum workers in the current union, unionization push. Well, I wasn't that involved in Pasta MoMA because I, I had worked there before that and I, I enjoyed picketing the museum because I'd worked there and I knew a lot of stuff that should be pointed out, but uh, what was the other thing that the Pasta MoMA and what was the oh, first one? Just any advice for um, museum workers who are, you know, a lot of museum workers are unionizing right now. Um, yeah. yeah. So any advice, I guess. And academia and so on. I don't have any advice. I mean, you know, people are organizing very differently now. I mean, online, you can, you can reach so many more people. I mean, we did it all by like to me, I was saying postcards <laughs> and, and uh, in the, you know, talking to people and when you ran into them in the street or something. And so it's a very different time and place now. I mean, my organizing now is, is, is pretty limited to very, very local things. I mean, the small village that I live in and we have a hundred tankers a day coming through from a fuel disposal place through this tiny little historic village and so forth. I mean, it's it's stuff that's affecting people's lives, but not in the broad sense that to me is working on and so on. I, I don't have any advice about organizing now. Yeah. Um, well, I think that there's another question that um, both of you could speak to. Um, and it's about the role that you see public art and Tomia, you identify as a public artists um, as playing in public life now, how does it, um, what role do you see public art as playing in public life now in a digital age and how have digital media changed the audiences and impact of performance art as a live form of self present presentation? Oh, is this for me? <laughs> it's for anyone, but yes, you. <laughs> wow, oh, big question. You know, I, I actually think um, the internet is public space and, um, you know, we should really think creatively about how you to use that for the good. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, as, as more of our public spaces become privatized and surveilled and controlled, you know, by private interests, um, I think we really need to fight for for those spaces. We We really have to think about um, uh, a, a new vision for our cities and uh, for um, and, and the role that artists can play uh, in creating these visions for the future. Um, one of the things about war and, and love is that, you know, it's one thing to point to what is broken and what we need to fight for. It's another thing to to think about what we can build and what we want to see in the world. And so um, I really feel that's a public conversation, you know, that um, artists also need to step up and see themselves as part of, um, as, as citizens, you know, who, who have to contribute, you know, to, to um, the ways in which our neighborhoods and cities and countrysides look. I don't do any social media, so I am, I'm again, not the right person to talk about this, but uh, I think of people like Dee Dee Halleck of Paper Tiger, who did public television. That was sort of, in a way, the, the, the beginning of a lot of stuff we're seeing now. And she did an amazing job of organizing and still hard at it. Uh, so I, I don't see people, and it's probably because I don't do any social media, I don't know about it, but who are organizing online with with visual images, for instance, or, I mean, public art, so much public art now is is plunk art or plop art or whatever they used to call it, but uh, it's, it's, just, it's, it's just objects in public, and that's not real public art. I mean, public art is something, it should be something that, that like what Tamiya is talking about, is that makes contact with its audience and influences its audience or at least annoys them or something, <laughs> you know, at least get something going uh, rather than just something you breeze by and think, oh, that's pretty or that's nice or whatever. Uh, so that seems to me, I mean, so, does social media do any of that or that I'm just missing? 
Yes. <laughs> I think it connects people. <laughs> yeah, it um, you know, there are lots of people who hate Zoom, but, you know, if it weren't for Zoom, we wouldn't be able to talk to people on the West Coast or around the world. Or, I mean, there are good and bad things about about social media, certainly. Um, one thing, though, I, I think is that I, I've been seeing so much amazing work from young artists who have um, working collectively uh and and thinking very carefully about um, uh, ways to ways to you know really dismantle the art world. <laughs> you know, post COVID, I think what what we were looking at is just um, a, a need to not just personally reset, but reset all our institutions. You know, to really think about who they serve. You know, and who benefits from from some of these cultural institutions. But most you know most of the time, Time I hear people saying, you know, they, there are no galleries to show in. There's no, um, you know, they don't want to have anything to do with the art market. And, you know, uh, they they want to have control over how their work is viewed and and um, shared. And so, this is the moment, you know, to Absolutely. to really rethink what an art world could look like. Yes, and and just art that um, I just co curated a show recently with at uh, Site Santa Fe about water, called "Going with the Flow: uh, Art Actions in Western Waters" or something like that. Anyway, we had we we were sure that we put some things in the gallery and something every artist had to do something outside the gallery, so that they were confronting or not confronting necessarily, but interacting with an audience and some of the pieces were very effective at that. And I think that's something public art really can do is it's it sort of open its arms on some level and or or its head or wherever you want to go <laughs> yeah for sure um it is 402 uh we we have so many questions in the q a that we that we haven't answered but we are at our the end of our time i do want to mention that in the all's fair show for those of you who haven't been into the gallery yet and haven't looked at some of these archival materials um uh, Judy Baca's um, The Great Wall of Los Angeles, the documentation for that was included in the All's Fair show, um, which is a was a huge public mural. Um, and then also um, the Sisters of Survival, which were a feminist anti-nuclear group um, who did a public art performance installation in front of the LA City building. Um, the documentation for that was also in the show. Um, that was not a permanent piece of public art um, as we think about it now, as you mentioned, Lucy, but definitely one that asked viewers to engage in those driving by to engage um, in, in an uncomfortable truth, which was that the government really didn't have our backs in terms of um, nuclear warfare um, and the threat of nuclear warfare. So I think all of these issues are just so present still. Um, and, you know, and here we are engaging with them again. Um, I just want to thank all of you so much for being here. It has been lovely, a dream. A year ago, when I was thinking about putting this together, um, I would not have in my wildest dreams thought, I'm going to ask Lucy Lepard to come talk um, and then have it happen. I just, I know I'm sort of fangirling a little bit, but um, Tomia, <laughs> Lucy, I'm just so in awe. Um, and I was going through these images, putting together, you know, the slideshow for this today and was just getting a little emotional um, because of the incredible work that um, you all did and, and still do. Um, so thank you for doing that <laughs> and um and setting <laughs> <laughs> um but we are going to move to a gallery walkthrough um that is going to be virtual um so those of you who are in person if you want to if you want to participate in that you are welcome to walk to the gallery um which is just you walked past it probably to get into the room that you're in um, and if you are online, feel free to um, jump ship or come along with us. Um, I'm going to put up a slide that just says where we're going um, and that we'll get started in a moment. Um, but again, thank you all for being here, all of our attendees, all of the questions. And there is even a class from the University of Texas um, on the call as well. So thanks for uh, bringing your class, Joanna. Um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody.
So hi, thanks for coming along on this virtual uh, visit to the Thompson Library Gallery. I'm not sure how many people on this call are um, from Columbus or from afar. I see Karen Stock. Uh, by the way, I want to shout out Karen Stock. Um, hi, Karen. Karen is a dear friend of mine and was my first art history professor in uh, at Winthrop University in South Carolina. I went to Karen when I wanted to take an art history class to be with uh, with with my buds. Um, and she told me, well, this isn't going to be an easy class. Hi, hi Karen. Um, and uh, it wasn't, but it was really fun and it changed the trajectory of my life. So thanks for overriding me into the class, Karen, and I'm so glad you're here. Um, so yeah, Cameron, you can stop um, moving around, maybe like focus on that first case there. <clears throat> yeah, like kind of like that, yeah. So um, the impetus for this exhibition sort of came out of, um, it started way back in 2019 when I started in my position at Ohio State, and I started thinking about things that I might want to do in the gallery, and I was really excited by the collections of our rare books and manuscripts library. Um, as you can probably tell, and um, <clears throat> especially if you're there in person, but um, also just from the conversation that we had over Zoom just now, um, what ended up happening is that I dug into the archives um, and for those who are unaware, our rare books and manuscripts library. Um, oh yeah, okay. Maybe if I turn off my video, maybe that would be better. Tomi, uh, Tomi asked, said, is there a way for the gallery to be on the full view or split screen? I I pinned um, and that allowed me to see it full screen. Oh yeah, okay, that worked for me too. Do you know how to do that, Tomia? Uh, no, but that's okay. all right. <laughs> well, go to the um, right-hand corner of the video of the gallery. There's three little dots and then you can click pin video. Okay, thank you, I'll do that. Okay. Um, so what ended up happening is I started going through all these feminist materials, um, in the rare books and manuscripts library. And by the way, we have a lot, um, we have riot girl zines, we have collections of second wave feminist newspapers, we have radical publications of all types. Um, and we have a collection of second wave feminist posters, um, which are on the outside of the gallery and highlighted in this copy of the new women's survival catalog that's in the the right hand corner of this case. Um, yep, right there. <laughs> um, this case, um, well, I'll get to that in just a second. But so what happened is I started digging around. Um, and when I was talking to a few people, um, someone asked me, what's the anchor for this for you? Because I was trying to figure out how it's going to narrow things down. I was just getting too excited about everything. Um, and they asked, is it Ohio State? And I was like, well, I don't know. I mean, how much could possibly have happened here? <laughs> um, and that was when I um, started going into the University Gallery of Fine Art Archives um, out at our university, university archives um, location. So it's a separate collection just for those of you who aren't at OSU. Um, our Rare Books and Manuscripts Library is a Rare Books Library. It's in our special collections in our main library. And then the university archives keep university records. And what I quickly discovered is that, um, obviously, ignore me, um, feminism had really permeated Ohio State in the 70s and 80s, um, had really influenced what was going on um, in the academic departments, but also that it was still sort of um, what Stephanie Blackwood, Blackwood termed um, sort of um, a misfit. The Department of Art was a misfit department, and so was the women's, the Center for Women's Studies. Um, but they really worked together. And so this case um, showcases that kind of what was going on there at the time. Um, you might see that there is a clipping. Carolee Schneeman came to campus as a visiting um, assistant professor or visiting um, visiting artist for a year in 1982, or at least the spring semester of 1982. Um, the Blatant Image is a, a magazine of feminist photography um, that was used in classes. Um, there's a syllabi or syllabus, sorry, of a cross-listed class um, for women's studies in art. Um, that letter right there, I love. Uh, Carolee Schneeman uh, typed up 
all of her letters that we have in archives are on this splatter paper, <laughs> which I think are really cool. Um, we have multiple artist books by her in the rare books and manuscripts library too. Um, but she came as a visiting artist. Um, she did a performance. She was in the visiting artist faculty show. Um, Take Back the Night was happening, which started in the 70s, women coming together and um, marching after dark um, to reclaim spaces traditionally, um, fear, you know, um, scary for women. Um, the Even the handbook for women um, that OSU put out, uh, which is right there next to it, took on sort of a vaginal shape in design. Um, the image is there and it says, uh, you can't see it on this screen. I'm so sorry, but it says, I am woman giving birth to myself. Um, and this was handed out um, to, to women, uh, community and university resources for women um, at the time. So as you can see, this I was really just trying to set the stage for what was going on um, leading up to the 1980s and in the 1980s at OSU um, and why these shows that I highlight in the cases um, on the other wall, which Cameron, if you want to take us there, um, why they were able to happen. Um, so this is the case for All's Fair, um, which was an exhibition that started, um, that was organized in 1983 that we've talked kind of a lot about um, with Lucy and Tomia. Tomia was involved. Um, as I mentioned in my introduction to the talks, um, this was put on in conjunction with the fifth annual Women's Studies Association Conference, which was held on OSU's campus. Um, at the time, Stephanie Blackwood, who became the assistant director, um, uh oh, Cameron, there we go, um, who became the assistant director at University Gallery was the liaison um, to help organize this. And she helped bring Lucy in. Um, they got funding uh, from the Council on Women and Minorities um, and the University Gallery uh, sort of promo image over all the way over to the left. Um, I just love um, the way that that is designed. It's huge and just kind of simple. Um, I found a lot of posters like this in the archives that I thought were really neat. Um, but I just wanted to um, share this exhibition and also how our collections were impacted by it. Um, we have, I mentioned the Sisters of Survival at the end of the talk. Um, the Sisters of Survival were a feminist anti-nuclear group. Um, they did a shovel defense performance in front of the LA City building, um, which Cameron is showing right now. This is the documentation for it, which we have in the collection. Um, there were photographs taken. They would dress up in colorful nuns' habits, um, hearkening sort of to the idea that um, nun they thought it was funny, first of all, but then second of all, um, that nuns are in order of um, in community of women coming together um, for for some cause um, in religion. It's God, but in this case, it was feminist activism. Um, but they were reacting to a quote by a government official who said all anyone needed to survive nuclear war was a shovel and to dig down two feet and then they could come out and they would have survived the blast. Um, so they built these shovels and they put them in the ground um, and they um, they walked around in their nuns' habits and they had, um, I think it says sh uh, shovel defense, a grave mistake um, on the banner. Uh, they also did a billboard um, by the highway in LA. And then they also published an artist book, um, The Sisters of Survival, Memento Mori, um, which we have in the collection as well. Um, it's in the case if you want to shift over. So it was definitely a performance art project that sort of had a beginning and an end. Um, they traveled to Europe. Um, but, you know, Tomia and Lucy talking about love and war and how connected these things are to feminism, that it is always about those two things. Um, the Sisters of Survival in particular really tapped into that at that time. Um, and then those uh, artist books right there are um, by Ida Applebrug. Those are some that we have in the Fine Arts Libraries collection. Um, they are they were not in the show, but just to give a sense of um, Ida's work um, and and how this impacted um, our collecting at the libraries. Um, Cameron, do you want to just show them um, 
So you can see the the catalog for the All's Fair show. We mentioned it was a postcard. The accordion book there um, is where Lucy's essay was. And then the enclosure for the postcards and the essay is in front of it. Um, but Cameron and Jeremy did a really wonderful job framing um, the postcards for the show. Um, so if you want to show that. So there those are. Um, yeah, you can go a little closer if you want. Um, and they, it's one for each artist. So if you do go see it in person, we made postcards for our artists that are on the walls, um, the contemporary artists, there's one for each artist, um, in the gallery right now, and you can take them home. And this was in the spirit and keeping with the spirit of this show. Um, yeah, so there's that. Um, do you want to move on to the next case? So um, this next case dealt with um, an exhibition that happened in 1985, and I will tell you, um, it, it is called Rape. I mentioned it a couple of times, um, or maybe once. I brought up some images from it um, when we were doing the conversation. Um, the Rape exhibition happened in 1985. Um, it also had 20 artists. Um, included in that group of artists was Anna Mendieta, um, who probably most of you know, um, died or potentially probably was killed um, in 1985, um, a couple months before the show opened and they they dedicated the show to her. Um, this exhibition was all artwork that dealt with the theme of rape. They did a call um, and actually, I think Tomia, you put um, some folks in contact with Stephanie. Um, I think she reached out to you. I found a letter where she referenced uh, you putting her in contact with some artists to um, reach out to for the show. Um, but nothing was done just in isolation um, through University Gallery in the 80s. Um, all of these exhibitions had um, really robust programming around them as well. Um, Viney Burroughs came and did um, a performance called Sister, Sister, which you can see the program for there. Um, you don't need to zoom in camera. It's okay. It's going to be hard to see. Um, but this show was very impactful. Um, they had support people walking around the gallery um, to help anyone who had issues um if they were triggered by the content at all um they had someone there who was trained to support viewers that had that found themselves in that situation but the ephemera related to the show was super powerful as well um there's a letter um there was a letter from sue co she and her sister mandy co um wrote a poem um called the rapist uh it's on that yellow piece of paper um that was just stuck in a folder um, labeled Sue Co. Um, this letter, the letter on blue paper, that's from Anna Mendieta. She was on her way to Egypt, um, likely with Carl Andre uh, after they got married. So these little bits of um, art history, you know, like the show itself, it would have been amazing to go see it, but all these connector pieces um, just come together to present a full picture. Um, and they had anti-rape um, workshops going on and self-defense things going on and um, film screenings and just all sorts of things to um, support and promote the show. And then it traveled to other uh, galleries around the country um, for two years. Uh, it was the first traveling show out of OSU, um, the University Gallery, and um, it was received well in, in all the places it went to, as far as I understand. Um, we have the guest book entries from when it was at uh, the University of Michigan. Um, it's really, really thick, um, typed up entries from the guest book, and um, people just really responded well to it, um, were very moved by it. Um, but it was very bold of them to do this in the 1980s. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, we can move on, I think. I'll try and go a little bit faster. I know we're getting towards time here. Um, I can just very briefly say, um, I think many people on this call will be familiar with Judy Chicago's work. Um, she uh, did the the birth project was a large scale exhibition 
where she worked with over 150 needle workers to create works, tapestries um, that involved the act of reproduction. Um, the one on the uh, poster has um, this goddess-like figure uh, feeding these children underneath um, with milk from her breasts, which I just absolutely love. Um, one that you can't see in here is this like really orangey red tapestry. It's it's in the newspaper clipping there, but it's in black and white, obviously. Um, but it's vaginal and it's just this like birthing of there's not a baby, but it's like this birthing of energy um coming out. Uh, and I just I it's it's just really wonderful. Um, but there was a docent guide, it was a whole thing, and it came through as part of Artworks 85, which is a celebration of women in the arts um, with programming all over the city, um, largely out of the YWCA downtown. Um, and then if you want to just turn around, Cameron. Yeah, so this um this case um were some sort of smaller exhibitions, including um there was a show called acts of reclamation that it that was a two two woman show nancy sparrow and um, barbara shavis barbara shavis was a columbus artist um and during again not happening in isolation that show uh was funded um from a grant an affirmative action grant um that also brought a performance art group called urban bushwomen also um honey on the sweet honey on the rock um, and during that time, um, not in conjunction with, but I think intentionally planned, um, Jerry Allen, who was also involved with the Sisters of Survival and was um, did a performance art piece um, at the opening of the rape show, um, came and did a site-specific uh, performance installation called American Dining, um, which we have the ephemera for here. Um, the placemat named that dame was set out on a table um, and she would pose as a waitress and come and talk to participants and there was a jukebox and um, music was playing and also recordings of um, of her talking were um were there and it was all about investigating you know the the condition of the working woman um and so all of these things were happening within this one decade um which is really just sort of the point of putting it all out um is setting the stage for um you know it, it was just all happening here. Um, you know, like we think about New York and LA and, um, and places like that when we think about, and, and then also, you know, more rural places and feminist collectives and lesbian collectives and things like that. Um, but I feel like, you know, sometimes the Midwest gets left out of the conversation. I have this question mark in my head um, about what is it that brought these artists to Ohio? Nancy Sparrow was also involved um, with a show at Ohio Wesleyan called Visible Outrage with Sue Co and Leon Gullub and um, Art Spiegelman, and a couple others um, in the 80s, I think 86. Um, and so I just wonder, you know, why Ohio and, and why I come back so often? Um, I love that. I love that they did. Um, but it's interesting. Of course, there was the Warm Gallery in, um, in Minneapolis, I think. Um, that was a feminist art collective as well. So um, that was Midwestern, but um, if, do you wanna go around the corner now, Cameron? And then lastly, um, this case has to do, this will be brief. Um, this case, uh, during all of this time, of course we were having these uh, visual art exhibitions um, that were feminist in nature. Um, but there was also um, a strong uh, public programs and video art um, program uh, being led by Nancy Robinson, um, who brought all these feminist video series to campus. Um, so What Does She Want was a video series um, that was organized by Lynn Blumenthal, um, who founded the Video Data Bank. Um, many of those I think maybe all of the videos that are listed there are available through Video Data Bank now. Um, Revising Romance New Feminist Video was another um, feminist series that Nancy brought. Um, so, and then also Karen Finley um, performed We Keep Our Victims Ready uh, the year the the year after the Wexner Center for the Arts opened in 1990. And so we have the program for that, which I love if you could somehow get a good image of it. 
it's like all these breasts, you know, um, just very, <laughs> very surreal. And, but also very DIY feeling. Um, I love it so much. Um, but yeah, so just a variety of things that were happening here at OSU. And then to sort of wrap up, I'll, you know, my thought for this was always that there was going to be contemporary art in the gallery. Um, I'm personally friends with a lot of the people um, in the Department of Art, and I knew that um, there were feminist perspectives being um, influencing art that's happening here on campus still. Um, and, you know, my original idea, which was just excitement um, at the Rare Books and Manuscripts Library, and when I went in there, I was like, these second wave newspapers are just so great um is is one thing um but the contemporary art was always going to be a part of it and so when i started digging in the archives and it really came it became about um this intergenerational exchange um between feminists and between artists and between activists um in general um the through line from the archives and from these exhibitions that were happening um, through to today um, and these artists that presented work um, in the gallery uh, simultaneous to this archival material, um, it became much more logical to me. It made a lot of sense. Um, these works in front of you are by Brianna Glesak and uh, Gina Osterlo. Um, very different artists um, that both deal a lot with the body, um, the body, that identity, preconceptions. Um, Gina's work deals a lot with distortion. Um, and uh, in, yeah, so if you wanna turn around to um, Cameron, just last thing, um, we actually, maybe I'm not supposed to say this, I don't know, but um, originally, uh, Carmen Wynant, who is in the show and Cameron's moving to Carmen's work right now. Um, yep, quickly. Oh, there's Erica. Hi, Erica. Um, so Carmen, Carmen is an artist whose work is um, very straightforwardly feminist, I think, um, sometimes more straightforwardly than others. This work is called Passing On um, and was originally at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Um, and is obituaries of famous feminists and other women of note um, with Carmen's annotations and questions and corrections and clarifications. Um, and I think that it's a good um, piece to point out when I speak about intergenerational exchange um, because it really is about that. Um, and the feminist activism and um, histories that we are still living. Um, and I feel like the conversations between Lucy and Tomia today um, really just hit that again and again. Um, so I wanted to mention that as well. But a lot of our artists are dealing with these ideas of identity um, in different ways. Um, you know, identity as women, identity as um, uh, Filipino American women in some cases. Um, Dion Lee's work, uh, which is a video work. Um, and actually uh, she's in the she's in the Southwest right now um, as a resident uh, field artist for artists of the American West. Uh, she's out hiking. Um, but her work really deals with um, our place in the landscape um, and sort of like our impermanence here um, and impact on that. So so yeah, I that's that's it. We're at 432. So I went a little over. Um, but if anyone has questions, I'm happy to stay a few more minutes. And um, oh, thank you, Tomia. <laughs> I feel a little nervous. I, I'm not supposed to say that, but I do. Um, thank you everyone for coming. And um uh I just I really appreciate you all. And um, this has just been a lovely way to spend the afternoon.